Today we're going to be reviewing 2023 in political highlights, divided into very astutely measured categories. Our first category is, what else but the biggest gaffe? So I wanted to start uh, this category with two related gaffes um, from earlier this year, which some of our listeners might have forgotten about. Um, the first was Therese Coffey back mm-hmm. in February when she was Environment Secretary. Do you remember there was a shortage of lettuce and tomato in supermarkets and this was sort of exposing Britain's weakened supply chains post-Brexit? But her response was that Brits should be eating more turnips instead. A lot of people would be eating turnips right now rather than thinking necessarily about aspects of lettuce and and, and tomatoes and similar. Which was rather now, austere. why is that a gaffe, Anish? <laughs> what, have you, what have you got against the humble turnip? D- to be honest, I actually do eat quite a lot of turnips because I get a horrible, miserable veg box every two weeks. So <laughs> I, I'm already on the coffee diet. <laughs> <laughs> they are pretty grim, to be fair. Um, and I thought related to that, you had the former Brexit MEP and Tory minister, Anne Widdicombe, who was asked in May what she would say to the number of families, because there's a rising number of families who can't afford the basics, you know, in their food shop. What would she say to people who can't afford the ingredients for a cheese sandwich? And she said, stop eating cheese sandwiches. But what do you say theory, to consumers who can't, it. literally can't afford uh, to pay even for some of the basics if they've gone up the way that cheese sandwich has with all its ingredients? Well, then you, uh, you don't do the cheese sandwich. And although these two these two gaffes are about different topics, I thought they really expose when ministers or MPs try and tell us what how we should do our food shopping or what we should eat. They always sound so out of touch. Well, that's all yeah. they've been doing for two years, I think. Yeah, now. they have. Yeah. Lee Anderson just stands up in the House of Commons and says, this is how you should shop every week. How dare you spend more than £1.50? Exactly. What it's was 30 the Lee Anderson a meal? stuff about the cat food? Do you remember that? He did eat cat food on his, on his television show? Yeah, I think on he GB did. News. Yeah, yeah. 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 I can't remember whether that was advertising the virtues of eating cat food for the rest of us or not. (laughs) Maybe it's part of the 30p meal. Yeah, maybe. The protein. Mm. I mean, my big question, I think, for this important political stories how many people <laughs> took up her advice yeah. you know, how many people are oh, well Therese Coffey has now said that we should be using turnips therefore I'm going to go and purchase some turnips well I think the funny part of that story was that actually we import more turnips than we grow here <laughs> so it was another example of how our, even supply chain, our food God. insecurity uh, is so acute um, what were your gaffes that you wanted right, to bring okay. in I was thinking about the great saga of Nigel Farage taking down the UK banking system when he uh, came out and said Coots had closed his account. Uh, A week later, the BBC reported that it was because he didn't have enough funds. Mm. Then Nigel Farage secured documents suggesting it was because of his political views. And you could sort of sense Nigel Farage, you know, his, he could he had a scalp to take here. And he just absolutely went for uh, Nat West, who owns Coots, the Coots board. And, it, and they got themselves in an absolute uh, pickle. A source from Coots told their business editor, Simon Jack, that the reason my account was closed is because I fell below the financial threshold required to hold an account. Yet this document proves that was wrong and reveals that the real reason I was cancelled. He's he a, took them out yeah. one after another. Oh, he did. Didn't he? They yeah. both was, resigned, didn't they? Did I? Do I remember that the, the boss uh, had to forego part of her seven million pound a year bonus? No, it was absolute tragedy for her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's going to have a really tough Christmas this year, I think. Ho ho ho! Um, I'm going to take a really, really obvious and slightly serious one. Sorry, Christmas. Um, HS2. Oh yeah. I mean, I have m- one of my big memories of the year is going to be at Manchester in the rain for the Conservative Party conference, which felt more like a funeral wake uh, than a party conference. At the moment when the Conservatives were about to cancel the high-speed railway link to Manchester. (laughs) And not only did they cancel the link to Manchester while they were in Manchester, they dillied and dallied and delayed all week. So nobody was talking about anything else. All their announcements, all their speeches, what there were of them, were completely obliterated by the HS2 announcement. I think to have a great, huge national project and then cancel it during the governing party's uh, political conference was a gaffe, but I think to do it in Manchester with this particular project was a mega gaffe, one we will not forget for a very, very long time. <laughs> HS2 is the ultimate example of the old consensus. Yeah, yeah. I remember hearing about that and then Andy Street called this impromptu oh, press yeah. conference outside the Midland Hotel so that, that it felt like almost like a we were outside Trump Tower expecting his, <laughs> his presidential announcement or something. Andy Street walks out and the nation's press gathers around him and he delivers this very strident, angry, emotive 
uh, condemnation of the government. And we're all there. I mean, mm. cabinet ministers are still speaking in the main hall or trying to set out what they're doing for government. And we're all just focused on listening to Andy Street. It was remarkable. <laughs> it was remarkable. It, uh, the whole choreography of Manchester was extraordinary because there, w- there was one political figure people getting genuinely excited about and following around. Lots of young people following around with kind of stargazing looks <laughs> on their faces. Unfortunately for the Conservatives, it was Nigel Farage. <laughs> yeah, and he's, he's also... His um, tour in Australia for Amos Lev will have been finished now, and I think mm. he's, you know, reforms up 8 7%. Yeah. We were saying before we came on, I mean, if the chaos in the Conservative Party keeps going, I think he'll be, he'll be quite happy. They'll be dreading him coming back from the jungle. All right, so let's move on to the next category, which is the marmalade dropper, marmalade dropper moment. Um, so this, for anyone who is not well versed in journalese, is basically when you know something genuinely surprising happens in the news. So much so that you drop your your, your marmalade, toast with which your marmalade. we all have every day. When yeah. We write our copy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in our sound check, I did say that I had porridge, so I'm not a proper journalist. It seems um, no marmalade to drop. So mine was Nicola Sturgeon's resignation because, I mean, as far as I understand it, the Scottish lobby and even SNP politicians weren't expecting it to come when it did in that way. It was a real surprise in February. There was this hasty press conference called, um, and she, you know, she 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 was quite personal in the speech. She said, you know, she'd been Nicola Sturgeon, the politician, all her life. It was time to spend a bit more time being Nicola Sturgeon, the human being. I have believed that part of serving well would be to know almost instinctively when the time is right to make way for someone else. But that narrative all kind of unravelled fairly quickly because you had these extraordinary scenes of her husband Peter Morrow being arrested and the house the with police, police tent. The police tent, yes. And the tent, the marquee in the yeah. front garden. It was like crime watch. It was, it? Yeah, it was like something from Line of Duty. And this was mm. over the SNP finances investigation that's still ongoing. And then she herself was arrested. And hunting down the camper van. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. finding the mm. camper van, mm. uh, working out yeah. you know, how posh the pots and pans were in their house. I remember that was part of the story. <laughs> yeah, it's remarkable to go from complete SNP dominance to this sort of undignified charade that yeah. lasted months and months and months. Yes, but also from, as it were, Saint Nicola yeah. to, yes. you know, Scotland's maximum sinner uh, in, in such a short period of time. It was, you're quite right, it was a remarkable moment. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's not the most remarkable marmalade dropper of the year, oh, really? but it was a heck of a one. Okay, well, why don't you give us your one? No, for me, I, I, was, I was sitting in front of my computer with a little TV thing on, on the side of the screen, um, and there is David Cameron walking up yeah. Downing Street on the day of the reshuffle. David, David Cameron! Cameron? What? Wait. I was not expecting okay. that. <laughs> okay. And um, I thought, that is clearly just a coincidence. How extraordinary. What a funny coincidence. <laughs> and then the thing came through, he's been made foreign secretary. I thought, I just simply do not believe that. It is completely impossible. He wouldn't. He hasn't. He has. <laughs> uh, so I think, to be fair to Rishi Sunak, I think he unveiled the greatest political coup in this sense of the year. Yeah, and he kept it secret as well, which is quite yeah, amazing. Which is there were no whispers about it. Yeah, I think there was a report that David Cameron told one of his children and they told someone, but... Hadn't gone any further, luckily Amazing. enough for them. Mm. But there, yeah, there were very few people in number ten. No one really in the yeah. in Parliament yeah. that yeah. knew about it, and then they kept it secret. But I mean, the, I think the interesting thing is why would David Cameron even come back? I mean, <laughs> Andrew, you've got this great theory that you think it means that we're going to have a, a later election because well, David Cameron wouldn't come back for a few months. I mean, you still, I, you still, I, you still I think certainly that? think. Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. We are in such a chaotic period yeah. again in politics. But I'm sure that Rishi Sunak's intention is to hold the election in October or November of 2024. And I, there must have been a conversation, surely, between him and David Cameron. David Cameron sort of swans in, looking very grand and fantastic. <laughs> and he has, earns enormous amounts of money in the private sector. He has yeah. a very agreeable life in his shepherd's cottage uh, in the Cotswolds and, and so forth. Is he going to give all of that up to be foreign secretary for a few months before an early election when the Conservatives are defeated? I think not. So I think he must have looked at Rishi and said, OK, Rishi, well, well how, long are we going, how long are I going to be here for? How long am I mm. going to be Her Majesty's uh, Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs darting around the world? Is it going to be just a few months or is it going to be a full year? And Rishi must have said to him, a full year, David, I promise. Mm. I like that theory. Freddie, do you have a marmalade dropper moment? Uh, I think, well, I mean, I was going to choose uh, Isabel Oakshot's Oh, revelations yes. about Matt Hancock's uh, sort of indiscretions on on WhatsApp and uh, about the uh, the COVID lockdown text. But 
to be honest, we've had a year filled with private conversations <laughs> that cabinet ministers and angry conservative staffers have been sending, but in part because of the COVID inquiry. So it's just been... You can't really get away from the the personal thoughts of mm. Dominic Cummings or Boris Johnson at the moment. And yeah. the foul language and the humiliation that Matt Hancock suffered, not on I'm a Celebrity, though that was in the <laughs> past, but in front of the COVID inquiry. In fact, I think you could say, you know, Freddie, marmalade dropper of the year, Matt Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the fascinating thing about the Oakshot story is that Matt Hancock even thought that she was trustworthy enough to do the book within the first if place because uh, she's done this with other people in the past she did it with Aaron Banks when they did a book he, Aaron Banks gave her texts or documents then she published it yeah. and Matt Hancock in his wisdom and um, tact said oh no let's do it and, again and it's, there are similar stories going further back I have to say with all respect it is quite, quite, yeah, quite if I had really kind of embarrassing humiliating personal and important messages I would not be giving them to Isabel Oakshot <laughs> she was on the other side of the lockdown argument as well very vocally at, um, yeah. during his tenure as health secretary in the pandemic. Um, so our next category is hottest mic. Um, <laughs> and one of my favourite hot mic moments was Gillian Keegan, the education secretary. Uh, and this was during the aerated concrete scandal when schools were having to close just before term started in September. She was doing an interview about it and then caught afterwards saying, Does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a f good job because everyone else has sat on their and done nothing. No, no, no signs of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually really liked this comment yeah. because it really revealed the frustration that you have with your predecessors. I think you know when you come in. Don't forget, we've had ten education secretaries mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. 2010. So she was probably thinking, why was I the one who had to touch this hot potato that has just been let lie since these schools were built in the 60s and 70s? Do you know, I think you're absolutely right about that. It was fundamentally an honest thing yeah. to say. She was furious, yeah. and she let her fury show. So hot. Mike, but not a gaffe necessarily. No, not a gaffe perhaps, but it doesn't reveal the, the fact that the Tory party isn't solving its own problems in it. <laughs> and parts of the Tory party, except that the other parts of the Tory party have completely failed in the past 13 years. Yeah, it's true. Uh, do, do either of you have a hot mic moment? There's been quite a few this year. There have been a few. I remember yeah. going back to Tory party conference when we had the manhandling and ejection of Andrew Boff, who was oh, yeah. this London Assembly member, right at the same time that... Um, Suella Braverman was on stage chastising the police for not dealing with real crimes. Yeah. You had Andrew <laughs> Boff. I mean, I, I was stood next to him. It was remarkable because he just muttered. He, he sort of mumbled the fact that he thought gender ideology wasn't real and he was basically expressing some anger that she was talking about it. But he was rumbling rather than heckling, wasn't he? No, yeah, it was just to himself. Mm. I could so barely you hear. Him, I was stood next to him. I could barely hear him. As soon as, you know, there was a bit of muttering, journalist's heads turned, security descended grabbed him and took him out and then the police got involved. Talk and then, about politicised policing. Unbelievable. <laughs> and Braverman's up there, so, you know, delivering this ode to freedom of speech <laughs> while, while their own London Assembly members being hustled outside of the yes, door. Yes, There's no such thing as gender ideology. Oh, institutions become captured. No, no, it's, this, this is true. As always happens when the left gets I mean, a young man, those who fail to talk are persecuted. Chased out of their jobs for saying that a man can't be your own. Well, my hottest mic moment, I don't know, are we allowed to say shithole? Because well, if we're allowed to say shithole, quoted then, we can, Keegan, then, then, so. I, then I have to say shithole, <laughs> which was allegedly, allegedly, uh, the way yep. that um, James Cleverley, the new Home Secretary at the time, described a northern constituency. I can't remember which one. Stockton, isn't Stockton, it? Yeah, Stockton. Stockton. He said a shithole. And Stockton's MP complained and Cleverley's defence was, no, no, I was describing you as a shit, not as that as a shithole, <laughs> uh, which is an interesting one. And, of course, Keir Starmer, who hasn't landed jokes very effectively during no. Prime Minister's questions, I think it's fair to say, gave a very, very good joke, of which that was the punchline uh, in PMQs the next week, um, and sort of pointed at, at James Cleverley. The, uh, the joke was that uh, Rishi Sunak was enthused by Greek mythology, which was ironic because he had the reverse Midas touch, said Keir Starmer. Everything he touched turned to, and then he turned to Cleverly and said, perhaps the Home Secretary <laughs> can help us out. And I said, and Cleverly looked furious. It is ironic that he's suddenly taken such a keen interest in Greek culture <laughs> when he's clearly become the man with the reverse Midas touch. <laughs> Everything he touches turns to... Uh, maybe the Home Secretary could help me out here. Uh, Rob, 
rubbish. So will the Prime Minister do the country a favour? So I said to him afterwards, I said, the problem was, that was a very good joke. And he said, yeah, the problem was it was very funny, wasn't it? <laughs> and we know that, you know, he likes the, the S word because he's actually been quoted as calling the Rwanda scheme batshit. Yeah, yeah. batshit. I mean, this is the problem, isn't it? Keir Starmer, no, he's not great at writing jokes, though he has improved towards the end of the year. But the Tory party are his best joke writers at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. They provide him with a lot of material. Um, and we did want to have a coldest mic moment. So not someone who has been caught uh, recorded accidentally, but someone who has said a very icy comment on Mike. Um, and we thought we'd include Keir Starmer in this bonus category. This was when he was asked whether, when at the football, he'd rather sit next to fellow Arsenal this fans. This was in Davos, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was also when he said um, that he'd rather be in Davos than, than Westminster. Um, but he was asked whether he'd rather sit next to his fellow Arsenal fan, Jeremy Corbyn or Piers Morgan, and he answered so quickly. You're an Arsenal fan. I'm going to give you two, the names of two diehard Arsenal fans and you've got to who, choose who you'd rather sit next to. Piers Morgan or Jeremy Corbyn? Piers Morgan. Hmm. <laughs> and I thought it was, um, it was definitely a, a moment of vulnerability because there could have been a spoonerism where he said Piers Corbyn. <laughs> <laughs> Which would not have been a good no, answer, no. let's face it. You would it. not want yeah. to sit next to him at the football. All right, um, our next category is most memorable speech. Um, and the one that I've chosen... Mm was from May, actually, at the National Conservative Conservatism Conference, which was this strange, both nativist and internationalist conference of right-wingers and populists. Completely yeah, um, which you will remember lots of uh, Conservative MPs spoke at, and Jacob Rees-Mogg um, stood up and, and did a speech. But what was extraordinary in his speech is that he admitted what Conservative ministers has, have denied since voter ID was yeah. first mooted back under David Cameron and Eric Pickles. Um, he said that actually it was an attempt to favour Tory voters. I mean, he said it was a failed attempt. Parties that try and gerrymander end up finding that their clever scheme comes back to bite them, as dare I say we found by insisting on voter ID for elections. So we all suspected that they wanted to try and make sure that it was sort of elderly people yeah. to, who, who turned out more than ethnic minorities and younger people who might not have the... the the, the uh, adequate ID, but it didn't turn out that way. Well, this is part of the problem. You've got so many Tory ministers who have either resigned or left the government or now hate the current government that they've, they've got this sort of candour yeah. about what's happened in the past. So they sort of tear themselves apart. I mean, it's great. I mean, it makes our job quite easy because I was like, oh, yes, OK, well, thank you for telling yeah, us that. Yeah, at least you being honest. Yeah, yeah, quite. All right, what speeches do you remember? Well, and we have to turn at this point to Penny Mordaunt, yeah. <laughs> because first of all, let's go back to the coronation and remember that you don't actually have to say anything to be very memorable, because True. Penny, of course, was the one carrying that absolutely enormous two-handed sword through Westminster Abbey while wearing a very, very flash and flattering looking uh, embroidered coat. And I think for an awful lot of male conservative England right across the country in the shires everywhere, old chaps were looking at their television getting very, very overexcited. <laughs> so much so that people are talking about her being, being, being the next story leader purely on the basis of carrying a sword. Which she, she carried the sword very well. Unfortunately for her, she then made a speech at the Conservative Party conference, which was, sorry, James, cleverly, one of the most batshit crazy speeches <laughs> I have ever seen, where she was talking about stand up and fight. And she wasn't quite sure. She was, we must all stand up and fight. And if you stand up and fight, the person next to you <laughs> will stand up and fight. And if the person next to you stands up and fights, the person next to them will stand up and fight. Stand up and fight. Stand up and fight! And at this point, you've got in your head this kind of wild, arm-thrashing, mad kind of image of people thumping each other. And then she says, and if one community stands up and fight, the next community will stand up and fight. And if your country stands up and fight, another country will stand up and fight. And I don't know what she thought she was saying or doing, but she had one forefinger, yeah. a bit like a sword, yeah. held in there all the way through. And it was one of the most extraordinary kind of failures on a, on a main platform I have ever seen. Yeah, she was striding around the podium, wasn't she? That's right. She clearly thought it was going terribly well. well it was at the start, and then it just kept going and going and going. <laughs> Maybe she just forgot like her 25 next minutes. Slides, she was like, let me just dwell on this oh, fight God. imagery yes, for a while yes, before yes. I remember. But, you know, we, we, I, I, I think she's a wonderful woman and very, very admirable because, of course, she might be Prime Minister next week. So we're, we must be careful what we say around these microphones. <laughs> and, right. you know, the Tories are fighting. Yes. Well, just the, each other. The, naturally, always. I mean, I, I think... For me, Rachel Reeves' speech at Labour conference was quite charged. She was clearly, she's g herself up. I've not really seen her speak with such energy and stridency. And the, the room loved it. I just, I remember thinking, 
this is almost too loud. You know, no one's really listening to her. Yeah. What she's saying because they're so excited. I it had was, to wrestle. She was angry. Wrestle security to get into that room. It was so. She packed. was. She was very, very effective. Conference. When we next meet, I intend to address this hall as Britain's first female Chancellor of the Exchequer. Was she as effective making the speech as the expression on her face when Keir Starmer was showered with that oh. a sticky glitter during his speech? She really looked like she was about to thump somebody. It was yeah. quite impressive. Yeah, she did. Yeah. For goodness sake. For, For goodness, goodness sake. sake. And I have to say, can I just add in there? I do think we have to um, give a little um, thumbs up to Keir Starmer mm. after that moment, just to take True. his jacket off and then actually deliver. It wasn't his best speech. It wasn't as good as the speech the year before, but it was in a quite an effective speech. And I think under that kind of pressure, after that has happened, that was reasonably impressive. No, I thought it was very good. It was very good. It was coherent. He also set out a, a sort of, you know, soft conservative message on uh, patriotism and uh, bringing communities together. And he also spoke about this more uh, left-wing ideals on the, the economy. I thought it was tremendous. Mm. If you think our job in 1997 was to rebuild a crumbling public realm, that in 1964 it was to modernise an economy left behind by the pace of technology, that in 1945 to build a new Britain out of the trauma of collective sacrifice, then in 2024, it will have to be all three. All right, so our next category, unfriendliest fire. So this, by this, we mean the most vicious instances of friendly fire, which is mm. when someone's attacking someone on their own side. Um, my pick for this is a bit more serious. Uh, it's the reaction within the Labour Party or from yeah. some within the Labour Party to Labour HQ's uh, controversial attack ad that you'll remember was published in April. It had a big picture of Rishi Sunak's face on it and it suggested that he didn't think paedophiles should go to prison. Uh, and Zara Sultana, Labour MP for Coventry South, someone on the left of the party, she accused her own party's officials of playing on racist tropes of Asian men. She said they knew exactly what kind of race, racist tropes they were playing on. And she accused the party of being institutionally Islamophobic. I personally was quite offended at a poster that was on our Twitter feed, the Labour Party's Twitter feed, which had Rishi Sunak's face but said... He doesn't think that adults convicted of sexually assaulting children should go into prison. And again, when that was wild, wi widely criticised as playing on racist tropes of Asian men um, around sexual assault and paedophilia and should be taken down, in fact... There was a doubling down on that and that tweet was never taken down. And I thought this was an interesting reaction. Um, first of all, because she wasn't alone. There were other, mm. other MPs who were criticising it. Barry Gardner said the party was descending into the gutter. But also because her criticism almost foreshadowed the more widespread reactions to Keir Starmer's um, stance on the Gaza ceasefire. Um, he has been accused of, um, by, by MPs on the right of the party as well, of, of potentially hemorrhaging Muslim votes by the way that he's gone about it. Mm. I mean, something that could have been a gaffe, but probably was too serious to be categorised as a gaffe mm. was how he said in that LBC interview he defended the idea of besieging Gaza. A siege is appropriate? Cutting off power? Cutting off water? Well, I think that Israel does have that right. It is an ongoing situation. Um, obviously everything should be done within international law, but I don't want to step away from the sort of core principles that Israel has a right to defend herself and Hamas bears responsibility. And that was a really interesting moment because yeah. Nick Ferrari was, you know, the, the question was unfurling and you could almost see Keir Starmer trying to answer the question before it had been properly asked. Yeah. He hadn't really listened to the question. He just True. jumped in. And that's a mistake, you know politicians make, but experienced politicians should really not be making that kind of mistake. But I would have thought the the bigger mistake was not immediately correcting yep. what he had said. They left it for, I think, nine days. Yeah, it was nine before, days. Before the full explanation came out. The interesting thing out. as well was that journalists in the lobby didn't really pick up on it for a few days as well. It didn't dominate the news for a while. So it's yeah. not, you know, it sort of just got I think left was... to the side and then it finally filtered through and everyone was like, oh no, that's quite a big deal. And then people started getting angry yeah. and then Lotto were like, okay, well maybe this will die down. Then it didn't. Um, it, so was were... strange, it was a strange, it was a strange, it, usually the public, and I'm not saying this in a disparaging way, but usually the public moves much slower in their response to political things because they're doing other things, whereas we're watching every second. But I think we were bogged down in Labour conference, didn't quite get the um, mm. significance of it. And already it was out in, 
you know, in constituencies where these issues are extremely pertinent and people were furious, councillors were, were resigning. So any other instances of unfriendly fire you want to bring up? The Tory party, I guess, for the past 12 months have <laughs> just been riddled in it. <laughs> I think that's absolutely right. We cannot ignore Suella Bradman's no. resignation letter, which was so scorching you could almost see the flames and smoke coming off it. <laughs> I have never read a more angry, devastating, um, punch, yeah. punch to the throat kind of resignation letter in my life. And, of course, it was followed up um, uh, afterwards by a resignation speech when, in which she said the Conservatives were going to go into... What was the phrase? Electoral oblivion. Ele- electoral yeah. oblivion within months yeah. if, if she didn't get what she wanted. Um, to be fair, on the speech, for uh, for her standards, I thought it was quite understated, really. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the speech that I she did, made in yeah. follow-up wow. to her sacking? Yeah. Is this the I one? did, yeah. yeah. She said she was going to support the Prime Minister. She, she didn't call him a shithole. No, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I, I was quite, I was yeah. quite impressed yes. the decorum. Yeah. <laughs> Though I have to say, uh, in a more serious and perhaps unexpected way, I thought her speech to the Tory party conference was one of the best yeah. speeches there and certainly one of the best she has made. She, We know she's ambitious because she is taking tuition in how to speak publicly. She mm. has come on hugely. And even if you didn't like any of what she was saying, it was a very, very well delivered, very cogent and coherent speech, which the audience absolutely yeah, loved. They loved it. Our country has become enmeshed in a dense net of international rules that were designed for another era. And it is Labour that turbocharged their impact by passing the misnamed Human Rights Act. I'm surprised they didn't call it the Criminal Rights Act. I don't think we can forget Nadine Doris's book as well. (laughs) This like semi semi semi-fictional, semi-real narrative about the conspiracy theories in the in the Tory Party. The movement. The movement that the this Dominic Cummings obsessed group of or cabal has been that took down Boris Johnson. It's a very, I mean, I have actually read the book and it is a very serious uh, at, at root allegation that there is a tiny gleek of very, very unpleasant people mm-hmm. at the heart of conservative politics who simply destroy prime ministers and put in people depending on who they want to see there next. And um, the laws of libel meant that she gave ridiculous kind of James Bond um, pseudonyms to everybody, um, but, but then started naming people on the but, radio. But then, well, she she hasn't she hasn't gone the whole way because no. of, because of my learned friends. Um, but one of the allegations in the book, which I thought was more extraordinary and deserved a wider um, circulation, was she argues that Sue Gray was basically working for Michael Gove yes. for a long time, it's interesting. and that Michael Gove has therefore got his person right at the heart of Keir Starmer's <laughs> operation, which I thought was quite an allegation. Yeah. And then we have a few wild cards. Uh, this is where you can bring in any moments that okay. you just want to want to remind our listeners of. Um, one here is is a more recent one. Jim Shannon, the DUP MP, he was talking about the protection of red squirrels, um, and he said grey squirrels are the Hamas of the squirrel world, which I thought. <laughs> I think that it's defends everybody. It defends yeah. squirrels, yeah. it defends <laughs> Jewish people, it defends Palestinians, it yeah. defends absolutely very, everybody. It covers all bases. It's a very um, um, British parochial <laughs> take on a very an international conflict in the Middle East. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any any more from you? Right. Well, this this one I I loved. I thought it was very funny. Um, the the Orkney the Orkney Islands when they said they were considering joining. Norway. Oh, I remember. It yeah. was this abandoned ship. Mm. This is so awful. This country's gone to the dogs. <laughs> We're off. Um, which I think just captured the orcs the, it. the <laughs> orcs it. They captured the national mood quite well. But of course, or- orcs it. I mean, Orkney was Norwegian or was Scandinavian mm. yeah. for a very, very long time um, until I think the early 1500s. So they have a very strong Scandinavian uh, culture and, and heritage there. It wasn't an entirely mad thing to do. And after all, Oslo is, is probably as near, more or less, to Orkney as, as London yeah. is. Andrew, do you have any wild cards of the year? Well, one of the really enjoyable parties of the year was the launch party for Rachel Reeves' book on the history of female economists, which, by the way, is actually rather a good book. Unfortunately for her, the Financial Times spotted very, very quickly that chunks of it had been, as it were, cut and paste from Wikipedia. And all journalists who spend their entire lives cutting and pasting from (laughs) Wikipedia instantly expressed (laughs) absolute (laughs) outrage that a politician should have copied from them. Um, But to be fair, it really ruined the launch of that book. It was a bad moment for her. Um, you know, she's she's gone through it with a certain amount of good humour, only a certain amount, I think. Um, so that's, that's I, I think, one of the big unexpected 
moments of the year. And of course, instantly in the autumn statement, for instance, um, Jeremy Hunt was using that and accusing her of being the cut and paste chancellor. It's a jibe we're going to hear for some time, I think. Yeah. And, and, and interestingly, the reviewer who spotted this plagiarism, she was doing an in-conversation event with Rachel Reeves the next day, which to the shadow chancellor's credit, she did turn up to. Apparently, she gave her a very, very firm handshake before it started. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. We'd love to know what you think. Please make sure you leave your comments below. And if you enjoyed watching this podcast, you can watch more of our videos on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to like and subscribe.